I invite uh, Praveen Verma. His topic is Who is a Farmer through uh, Punjab Land Alienation Act 1900 to Three Farm Bills of 2021. Uh, thank you very much. I think it was an incidental chapter. It was not part of the scheme of theses I had in my mind, but the movement against the three laws, which compelled us to write a little bit about this. Uh, so I'll talk about a little bit my work, what I'm working on. So I'm looking at the changing norms of identity assertion in Punjab. from 1900 to 2000 so looking at the macro history of 100 years what happened to the identity and its interaction with law uh, so because i'm looking at the law legal engagement with the identities and identity 1900 to 2000 2000s yes uh, so it's not a genealogical history i'm writing but yeah so so these three acts came at a time when i was writing about like what happened to uh, the colonial laws which were there and why these reading these three laws or talking about these three laws in terms of identity assertion it's important to look back at the history of these laws and this particular region uh so i'll start at the back back uh, backward from the three laws to the uh, go back to the 1900 act which the act came one of the act came in in punjab and punjab when i'm talking about is undivided punjab which is uh, pakistan Uh, Indian Punjab, Indian Haryana, and Himachal, but not mostly. I mean, uh, the documents I have been reading, it's excluded, uh, excluding Himachal mostly in that sense. Uh, so, in September 2021, ruling party in India proposed three different acts related to farm and farm-related activities, and particularly these three acts named as Farmers Produce Trade and Commerce Act 2020, Farmer Agreement of Price Assurance Act. 2020 and the third one was essential commodity act eca so these acts were proposed and propagated by the ruling government as unique and liberatory for the farmers however these acts were not new in nature on, but only the continuation of some of the colonial laws which have been there at place of course amended many times so even the one of the first act where i started is punjab land alienation act uh, which came after the discussion in 1900 which gave exclusive rights to 16 different caste to uh, to own the land so it was land alienation so all the other caste was suddenly alienated by this act so before whatever the caste which used to hold the land they had to give up and the the act also worked in retrospective so doesn't matter if some some caste a or caste b own the land in 1870s so they will have to carry on they all have to give up one by one Punjab is one such place where agricultural and agricultural community have a high stake with regard to social and legal development from colonial to the post colonial period the debates that emerged from these three repealed agricultural laws of course they were repealed later on uh, were not only the changing agrarian landscape and its need in contemporary time but the, at the same time it was defining moment for the entire agrarian community of course the government of india was talking the state was talking about of course it's going to be a freedom for the Uh, uh for the farmers and the farming community business people who are uh, indulged in that so but the major question emerged from the vault is who is a farmer and what define the identity of a farmer so these are the kind of a question which came time and again like okay you're talking about the farmers of course the political debate was these are not the fa- actual farmer these are the rich farmers movement where the landless labors are where the dalit labors are where the you know those kind of debates so so this made me think of those question in the last uh, 100 years back what happened what constitute a farmer do the legal and social binaries follow the same chart so uh, the legal sanction for a farmer to be a farmer can be a different than the social sanction legally you can be a farmer but socially nobody accept you farmer kisan and kisani these are the two words which came in the lot of pamphlets not only in this time but from the 36 onward why 1936 is important where the first provincial autonomy came and the political debate roamed around these questions of kisan kisani all that uh do these two things meet somewhere in between the legal uh, uh the legal status or the social status or they overlap what is the historical construction of this identity which appeared to be a class kind of class kind of identity but in reality it is something else 
So Kisan or farming, farmers, it comes out as it's a class identity. But the, when you do a deeper scrutiny, you realize there is something more than the class. Because from the field, the, it's coming something more. It's not only the class identity is merging up. I mean, these are the questions which I was dealing from. And this is, I mean, I just return it and this is still in my mind. Uh, so this debate who's a farmer first surfaced in colonial period in Punjab when the government decided to give the right to agriculture to select communities, 16 to be precise, as I said. And so and the more dominant in these 16s were the Jats, Yadav, Ahir, Gujars, Rajput, uh, in some other district were Tarhans, different castes were there. The legal sanction not only gave agricultural right to those selected communities, but also frees the identity of a farm. So suddenly when the Land Alienation Act came up in 1901, the identity of a farmer freezed. So whoever is mentioned in the act will be considered the farmer and whoever is not considered that will be alienated forever. The question of categorization emerged in colonial Punjab in 19th century before the inception of this. The categories, the, the colonial state was dealing with the, this, how do we talk about this category, how do we define this category in Punjab. And there are various, I um, mean, research, there are various literature has been come up on that. The classification itself was a long and complicated process that took many turns, even within the colonial period. Those and some of those resurface again when it comes to talking about these three acts as well. So first I little bit talk about the law and the claim making. At the time of the recently concluded farmers movement and that too from a different entry point, it was a coincidence that, then, that it emerged from a movement that was labeled as rich farmers movement or uh, where are the landless labor? There are no landless labor. There are no Dalit labor. There are no Kameen. Kameen was a category of a landless labor in Punjab. And marginally, so, so dominantly the farmers movement is a rich farmers movement, which marginally joined by all these categories, all these identities. And these were the political debates. Legal, legal debates were something different, which came in the act, proposed acts, which repealed later on. I mean, it is true that the support of this movement, particularly these are my readings from the field work, support for the movement was coming from Punjab region. So a lot of people were also saying that you know, it's just the Punjab farmers are protesting. There's no farmers from Bihar, there's no farmers from Andhra, which is not also true. But predominantly, yes, Punjab farmers were there because they were the most affected because of the Mandi Acts, which I'm going to talk about, APMC Act. So the claim behind passing these three acts was to remove existing constraint on buyers to contract, purchase and stock agricultural commodities. These acts were passed by the central government. However, the prerogatives to pass, the th pass these three acts were not only with the central government. So the prerogative was with the state as well. Uh, for example, that essential commodity act was largely largely the prerogatives of the central government but the other two acts like farmers agreement on price assurance which is also uh, affect the contract farming mostly and contract farming in Punjab has been a bigger issue not only from uh, for last 20 years but I think from 1980s onwards so the other two the price assurance and farmer Sur farm service act and the third one is the produce uh, sorry the third one is called Farmers Produce Trade and Commerce, which is called APMC Act, Agricultural Produce Market Committee Act. So which is the most contentious, was the most contentious act during this period. So they, the government proposed to uh, go get away with this Mandi. So APMC is also called Mandis, to get away from the Mandis and to uh, democratize the space where you can buy the uh, agricultural produce outside the boundaries of Mandis. So one of the main claim was like, do not finish off, do not get away with the Mondays because otherwise anybody can buy, anybody at any rates, at anybody can sell. Uh, focusing on the public regulated market, this APMC Bypass Act was focusing on the public regulated markets were previously under the state level APMC Acts. And the APMC Act, coincidentally, it was came in 1937. It was passed by the Unionist government. So 1935, the first election held uh, after the provincial autonomy came. 36 and 37, APMC Act, Act the Mandi Act was came because the uh, the Unionist Party, which was mostly uh, the the parties of the farmers, Kisans, 
and Zamindara League. So they were in the rule and Chotu Ram was the development minister. So he passed that Mandi Act. The act which have serious ramification for states are usually passed only after serious discussion and consultation. You can't bypass because you know it's it's not in the only at the prerogative of the central government. So you need to discuss with the state government. But the state, uh, the, I mean the uh, the central government used uh, section 301, if I'm not mistaken, to bypass that law. And why the, there is a need to read these three acts simultaneously together? Because they share the same premises to let private player and more particularly contention was the non-agricultural entities enter the agricultural supply chain. So that was the more contention. And it goes back to the again the debates which I'm going to come back of the unionist parties debate that a farming community should own the agricultural supply chain. So from 1936 onwards that was the demand. So all these three acts relaxes the terms and conditions which affect the agricultural communities in the favor of non-agricultural section. When the first act restrict, restrict the purchase and sale of farm laws, the second one relaxes the terms such as stocking of agricultural produce under any circumstances. So anybody can stock. Now there's no need to, you have to have under the APMC Act that you have to follow certain bylaws, the, the farmers should be part of those uh, committees. Now you don't need to do that. Any, uh, uh, this proposed law, laws was talking about that. Under the semi-federalist structure, state-specific laws deal with agricultural trade within states. Some of these acts came under APMC Act. And the APMC Act mandated some of the regulate, ma regulated market areas which are called Mondays to purchase notified agricultural commodities with the marketing fees, payments and commission mechanism. So it's not that, that you can buy and sell anything in, in the Mondays. There are certain things are notified, the crops are notified, uh, the agricultural produces are notified in that sense. Historically, the agrarian reforms or agricultural market reforms in India had been a troubling issue. So the key words like agriculture, market and fairs, trade and commerce within the state comes under state purview. But various acts, through the various acts and some provisional list and the seventh schedule of Indian constitution, constitution and I was talking about the article 301, ensure that the free trade within the country will be the prerogative of the central government. So the central government used this prerogative to bypass the state law, to bypass the, trying to bypass the APMC Act, which is with the respective states, Punjab state government, Delhi state government, Haryana state government and whatever respective government. Hence, the passing of these acts created a fundamental rupture in central state agri relations. So the APMC Bypass Act restricted any state's regulation in designated physical premises, which are called market yards or the mandis. After the act, the central con center controlled all other areas than these market yards. So once the, the markets were opened up, like, okay, you don't need a mandi to buy or sell agricultural produce, you can buy anywhere. So that was the promise, the, okay, uh, the farmers from Haryana can go to Himachal or go to Madhya Pradesh and sell their produce. So that's the, that's the logic the central government used to bypass the APMC Act. Technically, the trade areas could possibly be any place but defined by the Act. The reason to do so was coming from the idea thrown by the economic survey in 2014 and 15. So there was a survey came that we need to keep the agricultural trade away from the APMCs, which was considered the den of a middleman and exploitative for the farmers. So that was the economic survey 2014 and 15 mentioned. And it is so, uh, I mean, it was so bizarre that the same was used by the 1935 and 1936 that the, the agricultural trade has been a den of middleman and the sahuka. So the identity of sahuka as in sahukar baniya became the, the, uh, the melting pot in 36. So and that was also same echoed in this 2014 and 15 economic survey report in a way. 
the enactment of apmc by i'm going to come back to history as well sorry <laughs> the enactment of apmc bypass act particularly hurt the states which predominantly had deregulated system of buying and selling agricultural produce as from now on any deregulated area within state would automatically come under the state government's control which will also allows the private players to operate freely in the already existing deregulated market it's not a regulated market in that sense this in itself absolve absolve any private player or to adhere to any state law and effectively nullify the state's law and control in agriculture marketing suddenly this will come oh yes okay so anyways i'm going to come back to that like okay what the the issue of the farmers emerge in that sense so the from the annexation to bringing out the punjab land alienation act which came in the 1900 uh the act which was came after like 7 to 8 years of debate so the lieutenant general charles rivage when he introduced the punjab land alienation land alienation bill to imperial legislative council on september 18 1899 he stated quote punjab is preeminently a land of yeoman and peasant proprietors and the expropriation of by money lender of these sturdy land owners men who furnish the flower of the army in india this is the opening statement of that and who look forward uh, even after all hardship and glories to a military career to spend the declining year of their ancestral ancestral acres had been progressing the sole and entire object of the measure is to arrest which he says an ever increasing political danger so that was the first statement of the opening statement of that so 19 1900 act again i'm uh, that punjab land alienation act which emerged it bifurcated the two different uh, the, the classes of into agriculturalist and the non agriculturalist and another statement which says the 1900 act was brought with a clear expression and defined permanent alienation which means include sales exchange gift wills and grants of occupancy rights i mean you can't you can't transfer the land you you are alienated suddenly if you are mentioned there within those 16 castes you are part of that otherwise you are not so the commencement of the act did not only take care of the right take take care of the right of the agricultural tribe so so when the when the act was mentioned so sometime they are using the agriculturalist sometime they are using agricultural tribe sometime they are using agricultural caste peasant has not emerged in that the act but also in the retrospect as was as i was saying if somebody hold a mortgage like saying 1870s they have to automatically give it away in favor of agriculturalist any mortgage land by the agricultural tribe even before the act came into being would be taken care by the deputy commissioner of the respective district no land belonging to the member of an agricultural tribe shall be sold in execution to any decree or order of any civil or revenue court whether made before or after the commencement of this act uh however some of these recent acts might not be talking about the farmers in that sense but they are they are inherently talking about the farmers so what is the critique of what is the what is my critique of this act and what is the critique of why i'm saying it was not only class identity it was also caste identity so so what my claim is a humble claim is the kisan is a caste identity at least in punjab and it's not a class identity per se because what did the what did the colonial state did when the colonial state was responding to the category of agriculturalist they also created a legal casteism in that sense statutory casteism because they freeze the identity of agriculturalist so it's not an occupation it's not like uh, somebody is working that they might be working but the next generation might not work so, but they freeze that act uh the law has also created a new class of money lenders because once you cannot mortgage to the non uh, agriculturalist who do you have to mortgage because a caste also has many classes they have a white collar or the rich class but they also have a poor class which has to which need to mortgage some so who do they have to mortgage to within the caste itself so the 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 act was regulated by the not by the actual practice or the profession but by the birth is uh, birth itself and this was the critique of ambedkar which he wrote in 1930s a big uh, small pamphlet he wrote and submitted to the imperial state 
so the the, the landless workers which are also called communes here will be restricted only to the common land of the village which is also called shamlat land in punjab which is a common land under the collective ownership of the panchayat and shamlat land is not owned by anybody but the panchayats and the panchayat act i'll also come a little bit on the, that 1912 act i'm going to take 5 minutes and the idea of land ownership won't be able to make cuts into these communities as this would be temporary not permanent on the shamlat land on the common land nobody has a permanent hold it's all temporary that it has to go back to the panchayat again uh so the non agriculturalist cover which which the came almost like 50% of the entire population in punjab and they were some of them were 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 part of the agricultural community they were part of the agricultural economy but they were suddenly came out of that in that sense just just this one i'm going to talk about the what happened the later phase the act came in 1901 1912 the panchayat act came 1907 the debate started 190 act 1909 it was passed and implemented in 1912 private arbitration is a potent means of popular justice declared temple the second secretary to the punjab board punjab village panchayat act was passed in 1912 this was an outcome of the royal commission for decentralization a board that was set up in 1907 and the discussion happened over two years the commission did not reveal anything new in terms of local governance and throughout the report in their recommendation they made use of the already existing terms and categories that already had their own biases attached so for example you know these these things of course in the discussion or the field work amongst the khap panchayat and other people actors in punjab it came panchayat has been there for hundred hundreds of years or they have been there for moguls moguls period on that so most of the things which they talk about is it actually reflect this 1912 act which was the committee was there was only one indian member in the com- committee there was no indian member so the 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 idea of panchayat is also not did not emerge as if it was coming from the uh, medieval time or whatever in that sense and the panchayat act also re- strengthened this identity of farmers and strengthened the caste base of this class this as it says the typical indian village has its central residential site just imagine what they talking about and just imagine what we know about the village with an open space for a pond and a cattle stand the inhabitants of such a village pass their life in the midst of their simple surroundings build it together in a little community with its own organization government you can see from where they were standing and looking at the village they were not looking at the periphery of the village where they can look the landless labor they were looking from the center of the village in that sense just last point i was talking about which i was just just one two minutes i'm going to take i mean it's it's a it's not i was didn't write that chapter a lot so that long back so that's why so what i was talking about that you know that new act was also this 2014 and 15 economic survey was talking about the this middleman and the sahukar has been you know exploitative in nature it was also not new in 35 and 36 chotu ram wrote a pamphlet called bechara kisan poor farmers and he says that the farmers have been throughout those years from 1900 i mean he's talking about historically the farmers have been exploited by the by the middleman or the sahukar or the banyas we need to we need to do we need to take care of that so the apmc act actually came to resolve that purpose of course they have unionist has their own biases which i can talk about if it comes in the uh, debate i mean discussion but they themselves put the farmers and particularly not i mean the rich farmers in the mandis committees so all these mandis all these areas which you have all the apmc act whether it's azadpur mandi or or wherever in punjab or in other part of the country they have representation from the farming community so the idea of this you know exploitative sahukar which came in the legal term was also was there uh, in the political uh, uh, slogan of that anyways i can talk oh, just last thing what i'm talking about why the agriculturalist also it strengthen the logic of that agriculturalist being a caste not as a class because the discussion over agricultural labor first emerged in 1936 and it came as a positive way when chotu rams the the, the uh, they were talking about the government talking about unionist government was talking about we have to give some certain rights to these landless communes 
who are also the agricultural labor not agriculturalist in that sense so so this was not maybe not it was not initiated by the 1900 act but it was also it strengthened the casteness of classness of the caste throughout those years which also reflected in these three acts which were repealed in last year thank you thank you